Welcome back to Be Ye Lifted, the online church of King of Kings Lutheran Church in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I am the lead pastor. My name is Marie Duquette, and it is odd, but it is good to be with you even like this. This Sunday, we are on question two of our four-question uh, sermon series, and the question this week is, where does it hurt? So last week's was, where are you from? Today we're going to look at, where does it hurt as God's beloved community? But first, let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Here in this space, we wear our hearts on our sleeves. There is no use in filters or walls. This space is an authentic space. This space 
is a brave space. For when it comes to God, we are always invited to bring our full selves into the room. So come into this space with your hurt and your joy, your prayers and your dreams. All of God's children are welcome here. Come now, let us worship the Lord. When we gather together, we're quick to wave and say hello. We used to easily pass the peace. We comment on the weather, make small talk, show hospitality. But how often do we really go below the surface? How often do we sit next to the same people? At one time, it would have been week after week, oblivious to the things they might be carrying. I believe God wants deeper connection for us than that. So listen now to our prayer of confession, and then join me in silent prayer following. Let us listen. Let us pray. I've been meaning to ask, how are you? What has your year been like? Do you know that I've been thinking of you? I've been meaning to ask, is your mom okay? Did your sister find a job? Did you ever think we'd still be here? I've been meaning to ask. Did it get easier? Did the grief subside? Were you ever able to sleep at night? I've been meaning to ask, but I haven't. Because it's hard. Because I want to say the right thing. Because I'm not sure what you need. I've been meaning to ask, so I'm sorry for my silence. Forgive me, show me where it hurts. Let's start again. Family of faith, we could all use some practice in asking where it hurts. Take a moment of silent prayer to think of the people in your world, in your lives, who may need you to reach out and ask. Give their names to God. Trusting that God hears all things, 
we say together, Amen. Amen. Family of faith. In the journey to love and care for one another, we are bound to make mistakes. Fortunately for us, we worship a God who showed us how to love and who extends grace to us when we fail to do so for others. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. You are seen, you are heard, we are loved, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for this endless grace. Amen. Holy God, today we will read stories of those who have known hurt, people who have carried shame, who have lived with grief and chronic illness, who have felt alone and ignored, who have seen the depths of suffering. As we listen, we will be reminded of the hurt we have carried during these fragile days, memories and regrets co-mingling in our chests. And as we listen, we will be reminded that our neighbors, our siblings in faith, also come to this space carrying burdens. So dust off our ears and stretch open the canvases of our hearts so that in our pain, we might lean into one another as we lean into you. Pull us close. We are listening. Amen. I'm a tiny mouse. And I'm a giraffe. We'll tell you Bible stories. Make you laugh. Let's see. Giraffe and tiny mouse. Tiny mouse and giraffe. That's, that's me. me. C R A. Hiya, tiny mouse. What you got there? I have a spelling book for mouse school. Mouse school, huh? Yes. It starts tomorrow in the basement. Are there many mice in the basement? I don't think so. The teacher mouse comes in from somewhere else to teach me. Maybe other mice will show up too. And you learn how to spell there, I guess. Among other things, yes. We learn how to spell cheese and crackers and other very important words. The bigger words make my little head hurt. You know, Tiny Mouse, the Bible talks about teachers. Mousy teachers? Uh, no, people teachers, I think. No. Anyway, the Bible says that teachers have to be very careful what they say so they can teach you well. Jesus was a teacher, you know. He taught his friends a lot about God and how people should live. Yes, Jesus was probably the bestest teacher ever. Probably. So what else do you learn in uh, mouse school? We learn to stay away from traps, even when there is cheese or peanut butter in there. That's a hard lesson to learn. I imagine so. Be very careful around traps, okay? okay. I'll, I'll give you cheese whenever you ask me so you don't have to nibble that stuff in the basement. Why, thank you. That basement cheese is kind of dusty anyway. A spelling bee, huh? Good luck with that. No, giraffe. Not bees. Mice. Mice. Oh, now my head hurts a little. Aww. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Now there was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zufite from the highlands of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. He was from the tribe of Ephraim, and he was the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf. Elkanah had two wives. 
one named Hannah and the other named Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah didn't. Every year this man would leave his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heavenly forces in Shiloh, where Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were the Lord's priests. Whenever he sacrificed, Elkanah would give parts of the sacrifice to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But he would give only one part of it to Hannah, though he loved her because the Lord had kept her from conceiving. And because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving, her rival would make fun of her mercilessly, just to bother her. So that is what took place year after year. Whenever Hannah went to the Lord's house, Peninnah would make fun of her. Then she would cry and wouldn't eat anything. Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband Elkanah said, would say to her, Why won't you eat? Why are you so sad? Aren't I worth more to you than ten sons? One time, after eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah got up and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting in the chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Hannah was very upset and couldn't stop crying as she prayed to the Lord. Then she made this promise. Lord of heavenly forces, just look at your servant's pain and remember me. Don't forget your servant. Give her a boy. Then I'll give him to the Lord for his entire life. No razor will ever touch his head. As she kept crying before the Lord, Eli watched her mouth. Nahanna was praying in, in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice was silent. So Eli thought she was drunk. How long will you act like a drunk? Sober up, Eli told her. No, sir, Hannah replied. I'm just a very sad woman. I haven't had any wine or beer, but I've been pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think your servant is some good-for-nothing woman. This whole time I've been praying out of my heart, great worry and trouble. Eli responded, Then go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you what you've asked. Please think well of me, your servant. Hannah said. Then the woman went on her way, ate some food, and wasn't sad any longer. Alleluia! 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 Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Gospel for today is from the book of Mark, chapter 5, beginning with verse 34. The Gospel of Mark. Jesus crossed the lake again, and on the other side, a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, came forward. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him, My daughter is about to die. Please come and place your hands on her so that she may be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowding in on him. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had, 
without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately, and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, don't you see the crowd pressing against you? Yet you ask who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, now full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. While Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house saying to Jairus, Your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Just keep trusting. He didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, What's all this commotion and crying about? The child isn't dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed at him, but he threw them all out. Then, taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, he went to the room where the child was, taking her hand. He said to her, Talitha kum, which means, young woman, rise up. Suddenly, the young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what had happened. Then he told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Today, we are looking at this question from our series. I've been meaning to ask you something. Today's question is, where does it hurt? I cast this question out to the congregation and got a few responses that were succinct yet quite personal about where it hurts. We don't have to think long about that question to have answers of our own. In today's gospel, we can trace through where it hurts all the way from the beginning to the end, and from the beginning to the end, we can consistently see Jesus' response to the pain. Listen. In the beginning, Jairus, you remember, the synagogue leader, pleads with Jesus on behalf of his 12-year-old daughter, who is dying. Jesus moves forward to go help, but before he's able to, a woman who had been also bleeding for 12 years and spent all her money on doctors, she comes up and she touches the back of Jesus' garment. Power went out of of him such that he could feel it, and she was instantly healed. But if you look at that story now and ask the question, where does it hurt? Let's see. You know it hurt Jairus when he realized he needed to run and risk asking this prophet, this healer he had heard about, or maybe even he had followed because his daughter was going to die. That would hurt. His daughter, suffering, hoping the adults in the room will take the pain away. That had to hurt. The adults who stay there do the night watch with her. Watch her writhe in pain. Yeah, that's that had to hurt. The woman coming through the crushing crowd, still bleeding as she has for 12 years, crawling on her hands and knees, maybe because 
she lost so much blood? I don't know. But the sense is that she's weak from the disease, but strong in her faith. <coughs> and that strength enables her to grab onto the back of the hem of Jesus' garment. But we can imagine it had to hurt crawling through the crowd to do that. It had to be hurting or at least making Jesus claustrophobic for the crowd to be pressing in on him. That had to hurt. Spending all the money she had on doctors trying to move forward, not yet healed, but broke. That had to hurt. And then if we keep reading, there is more. When he gets to Jairus' house later, everyone is crying and mourning for Jairus' daughter, who they believe is dead. They laugh at him when he says she's not dead, which makes me think of pain that people carry, all of us it seems at some time or another, of people laughing at you or mocking you or not acting like they care about your welfare your story, your life. And it hurts here and it hurts now. All of these examples, they hurt there, they hurt now. Who among us hasn't sat with a sick child or had a good friend whose child perhaps died or lost one of our own or dreaded it as the child made decisions that were not in their best interest, and there's pain there. But if you look at what Jesus does in response to the pain here and the pain to us, it's kind of surprising. We would like to say that Jesus comes to the rescue and heals everybody, and that would include your father who died last year. But that's not how Jesus tends to show up today. I'm not saying he doesn't. Because miracles are real, and I've witnessed a couple. But by and large, Jesus shows up far more subtly. And what he does is he disrupts what's happening. Jairus comes to Jesus about his daughter. Jesus um, moves to go to Jairus' house, thus breaking up the story Jairus is telling. The crowds move in. The woman touches the back of him. Jesus disrupts what just happened with the healing by looking around and asking who had touched him that the power went out of him. And he and the woman have a conversation that gives her dignity on top of healing. Later on, <clears throat> um, when the woman does confess to Jesus that she's the one that touched him, she does it with trepidation in front of everyone. It's like a confession when she tells him. He disrupts the confession to say your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Then they come and tell Jairus his daughter is dead. And before they could say much more, before Jairus, we are told how he even reacts, Jesus jumps in the conversation and says, don't be afraid. Just Keep trusting and she will be healed. And they go to Jairus' house. And when they get there, the pain is evident in the crying and the mourning for the little girl. And Jesus disrupts that by saying, don't cry. She isn't dead. She's only sleeping. Jesus goes into the little girl, who we are led to believe is dead, takes her hand. It says, Talitha Kum disrupts death for life for this child and for this community who loved her so. And that's what Jesus does today. And sometimes it's little things, like a conversation is going one way and then it suddenly gets diverted. Maybe it was, it was going the wrong way. And what catches the attention of those having the conversation? Something really simple, like an animal or a child walking by. 
a car with students yelling, excited to be back on this beautiful fall day. It could be something small, but sometimes it's something every bit as big as these healings. You know, it's so easy right now for us to name all the things that hurt because there are so many. And it's what God would tell us to do. It helps to set us free to name them. But we dare not do that and forget to look at all the places Jesus has stepped in in the last 18 months and disrupted things. Like in the beginning when people were singing to the medical staff when they left the hospitals and suddenly they weren't ending their day just worn out and frightened and exhausted, but they were ending their day to the support of a community that loved them and appreciated them and respected what they were doing. You could look at the vaccination. Did you think we would get a vaccination as soon as we did? I sure didn't. Did I think it was going to be made in the state that I was living in? No. We got this vaccination and more people are getting it every day and more than half the country has gotten it. That sounds like a dis disruption when you think it wasn't that long ago that we didn't know when we'd have a vaccine, right? And so one of the things I think it's important for us to do is not just count the pain, though that is helpful. It's part of the, pl the plan of self-care to keep going right now. But to look for all the ways, little and big, that Jesus continues to disrupt us today, that we might keep our eyes on what is good, what is love, what is of God. Amen.
I was led tonight to Isaiah chapter 1, to specific sections of it even. And I felt a very strong sense. It isn't really a voice, it's just a sense within me that said, read this, and I did. I think perhaps others should hear it too. Sometimes it helps when you're not reading it yourself. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not let listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Chapter 2. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples and shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they study war anymore.
Hear this benediction. Drink in the blessing. May God grant you the curiosity to counter assumptions, the vulnerability to be friend, the bravery to speak your truth, the wisdom to listen, the strength to ask for help, the resiliency to choose love even when it's hard, and the awareness of the Holy Spirit always beside you. In the name of the great connector, love itself. Go in peace. Love one another.